Something that I've learned from Drew Houston, the founder and CEO of Dropbox. I think I was like 20 years old and you know, it's a pretty cool brunch to be having. I'm sitting there with him and I'm asking similar questions. And he told me something that was amazing. He said, the problem people have with dealing with uncertainty, which is uncertainty is entrepreneurship. That's the difference between being an employee and being an entrepreneur is the entrepreneur takes on the uncertainty, right? Drew said the key that people misunderstand about uncertainty is that you're not born with it. It's a muscle. And people just assume that because they don't have it, it's not for them. He said, if you think of uncertainty as a muscle and you train it like a muscle, things start changing. Let's say you haven't worked out your biceps. You don't go to the gym and just start lifting the 60 pound dumbbell. No, you start with two and then you go five and you go 10 and then you take you know, a couple days off. You have to you know, have rest days. If you think of it the way you train a muscle, all of a sudden uncertainty becomes this manageable thing where you start small and you work your way up. And something that Drew said that I love, he said, when you feel the pain, that means you're working up a weight class. That's cool. And then he said, when you pull a muscle, like psychologically, if you've taken on so much uncertainty that you're having a panic attack, you're way too high in your weight class, <laughs> tone it down a little. It doesn't mean it's not for you, but you know, if you're, li I've done it, you know, you're lifting weights and you, you know, pull something, all right, you're gonna go down maybe 10 or 20 pounds the next time you go into the gym. And then you work your weight slowly back up. I've learned that insecurities will never leave you. Just like with fear, they're a natural part of the human condition. So your goal shouldn't be to rid yourself of insecurities. It should be to become so aware of them that they could be yammering away and you go, oh, that's just the insecurity. Because when they're calling the shots, when they're determining, determining your actions, whether it's your insecurity of I'm not enough, I'm worthless, I'm invisible, I'm unlovable, people are gonna abandon me. When you're not aware that that's driving your actions, that's when you get yourself into the biggest biggest disasters of your life. If anyone out there is dealing with an insecurity that they want help, you know, growing through, the first step is getting rid of the shame that surrounds it. Because the shame is what traps that insecurity. Think of the insecurity like a bug and the shame is like the, the glass on top of the bug. You can't deal with that bug if there's this guardrail. And the thing about shame is that shame can only live in secrecy. The second you speak something out loud, it doesn't have power over you anymore. And even in the writing of this book, that was some of the hardest stuff. When I was a kid, I would get bullied and they would call me like Fatty Benaya. Dude, it, first of all, it's still weird to even speak that, those words out loud. But the, fat, the act of writing it, even the act of saying it, the next time it's gonna be easier. And as soon as it doesn't become the secret anymore, you can start dealing with it. So anyone who's dealing with an insecurity, whether it's being invisible or not being enough, speak it out loud. Whether it's in therapy, whether it's in friends, with friends, or if it's just writing it in your journal. Because only then can you start to deal with it. What are some of the, the most impressive third door moments that you heard from other people mm. researching the book? Uh, my favorite is Spielberg's. Because in many ways, Spielberg's third door story embodies so much of the third door in general. Mm. And the reason I love it so much is because of how it starts. He was rejected from film school, which is bonkers. You know, it's like, <laughs> Bill Gates being turned down from a computer science class. Right. You know, Spielberg was rejected from USC film school multiple times. And he, what I love about him, is that instead of doing what most people would do is think, you know, maybe I'm not cut out for this, he decided he was gonna take his education into his own hands. So what he did is he registered for Cal State Long Beach, which isn't, which isn't too far away, and he arranged his classes 
So he would only be there, you know, Tuesdays and Thursdays. And he decided he would find a way to break into Hollywood. So what he did is, have you been to uh, Universal Studios mm -hmm. theme park? So you know that tram ride that takes you on the back lot? So Spielberg, when he was 19, goes to Universal Studios, goes on the tram ride, goes around the back lot, jumps off the tram, hides in a bathroom, waits for the tram to ride away, and starts wandering around the lot. And you know, he's popping his head here and there, and this older gentleman, his name is Chuck Silver, stops him. And Chuck Silver's worked for the Universal Television Library. And you know, this 19-year-old kid just starts mumbling, saying like, you know, my biggest dream is to be a director. And they end up actually talking for about an hour. And Chuck Silvers goes, you wanna come back on the lot? And Spielberg's like, that would be my biggest dream. So Chuck Silvers writes him this three-day pass and hands it to him. And Spielberg, you know, comes on day one, day two, day three. But on day four, he comes back onto the lot wearing a suit, holding his dad's briefcase, walks up to the security entrance, puts a hand in the air and goes, hey, Scotty! And Scotty just waves back and he walks right in. And for months, Spielberg would walk back onto the lot and sneak into sound stages, go into editing rooms, asking actors and actresses and producers out to lunch, soaking up as much knowledge as he could. And again, what I love about it is this is a kid who was rejected from film school and in many ways he created his own film school. And, you know, he's going around the lot and after a while, Chuck Silvers, who became a mentor to him, said one of the best pieces of advice he could have given. He said, Stephen, there needs to be a point where you stop schmoozing and you come back with something of quality to show people. And Spielberg, you know, took that hard, you know, we were talking about hard piece of advice. He took that hard piece of advice to heart and he stopped coming to the lot and started creating this short film called Amblin. And he spent months editing and even the way he produced and got the money for the film is like a third door story in and of itself. But he makes this little short film, comes back to the lot, shows it to Chuck Silvers. And it's so good that a single tear comes down Chuck Silvers' face. And Silvers reaches for the phone and calls up Sid Scheinberg, the vice president of Universal Television, and goes, Sid, I have something you have to see. You know, this guy's the VP of television at Universal. He's like, look, there's a lot of things that I need to see. And he goes, no, 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 no. You need to see this right now. And he goes, you think it's that goddamn important? And he goes, yes, it's that goddamn important. If you don't watch this tonight, somebody else will. And the best part of the story is Sid, uh, Sid Scheinberg still was sort of like lukewarm. So Chuck Silvers called, this is back when they had projectionists. Chuck Silvers called the projectionist for Sid Scheinberg's office. I was like, look, Sid doesn't want to watch this, but when he gets to the, you know, the projection room tonight, put this first. He pretty much put his entire reputation on the line for this young 19-year-old Steven Spielberg. And as soon as uh, Sid Scheinberg watched the movie, he said he wanted to meet Spielberg immediately. Spielberg ran over, got to the big office, and on the spot, he got offered a seven-year contract. And that's how he became the youngest director in Hollywood history. And when I reflect back on this story, you know, there's a million things that worked well. But, you know, Spielberg had incredible talent, but so do a lot of aspiring directors. What made the difference? And to me, it was really like this people game that he played, you know, jumping off the lot, meeting different people. But a people game sort of sounds like, you know, networking at a career fair. To me, it was like this Spielberg game. You know, jump off the bus, find your inside man, and use him or her as your way in. And really the key is that inside man. Because if you think about it, without Chuck Silvers, one, writing that pass. Two, which I think is one of the most important, giving Spielberg that advice that only someone inside of the studio would know to tell him. And then three, which is the ultimate one, putting his reputation on the line so Spielberg could get his foot in the door. None of this would have happened. And to me, I've realized every single person, doesn't matter if it's Bill Gates, Lady Gaga, Maya Angelou, Steve Wozniak, they've all had an inside man or woman who's believed in them enough to put their reputation on the line to open that door.